We've got some amazing people here tonight, and let's start with the uh, the creator, the god of Scream, Kevin Williamson. <laughs> Coming up next, the director of the film, Matt Bettinelli Open. And Dewey Riley. Rest in peace. So, Matt, I'm gonna start with you. Um, can you? I just want you to like set the table for us a little bit. How how did you find your way to this movie? Well, um, our good friend William Sherrick, who's here somewhere, who's one of the producers. I should say first too that I co-directed it with Tyler Gillette, who couldn't be here today because he was exposed to COVID, and we just want to play it super safe and you know be smart about it, but. He would have loved to be here and thank all of you. This is just wonderful, it's a dream come true. Um, so yeah, William Sherrick and Jamie Vanderbilt, they have a company, they, and Jamie's the writer of the movie, and they, uh, they invited us to direct it, and we jumped at the chance. It was, it was kind of serendipitous. We didn't know that we were auditioning for it, basically. They set up a meeting for us with the, the producer, and he said, I like him. And we got to do it. And that was the beginning of all of this two years ago, you know? And now we're here. And honestly, Surreal is amazing. You're the first crowd I've seen watch it, so. Yeah. Woo! Uh, thank you. <laughs> so I imagine um, that stepping into the movie was you had big shoes to fill. Yeah, you know, I mean, Wes is a hero. I think to probably everybody in this room, I can certainly say that for myself. Um, and so I think what I'm wondering is, you know, coming into something like this, like how, how did you want to sort of both honor the legacy of the franchise, but also put your own stamp on it? Yeah, we talked about that a lot, and I think it was really important to us to honor Wes, I think, more than anything, and those were the first conversations we had with you, and because um, that's not something we took lightly. He's an idol of ours, and so to even have this opportunity was incredible, and I think one of the things that we really learned from him is taking risk and taking chances, and you know that was something that we really tried to do in this, where we wanted to make sure that we took everything we loved about Scream and everything that you guys had done with Wes and then pay our respects to it and also pay respects by making sure that it moves forward. And that was kind of our goal across the board from day one. Now, when I saw Ready or Not, um, just, thank you, great film. And of course, everybody who's seen the film remembers the end of the movie, right? You know, we've got these exploding heads and it was really gory. And that was something that really stood out for me too with this film, was that this seemed like the most hardcore, violent, gory scream ever made. And I'm, was that another, was that part of your decision process in terms of how to kind of separate the movie a little bit from the others? You know, I think it's funny, because I think to us, the others are really gory and they, they really push the boundaries. And, we felt like we were kind of in line with that. You know, we got Tatum's head and like, you know, there's there's so much of that in the others that we just love because it always, I think one of the magic things for me as a fan of Scream up until this one is that I it, it's such a great movie that welcomes you in. It feels fun and big and popcorny and just like a great time. And then it has those really challenging moments where it gets kind of intense. And you're like, oh fuck, I have to sit through this, oh my God. And I think that's part of the experience. And so we really tried to make sure that we had that in here. And I think that's how it came through. Right, I think you had it. <laughs> I was there. Um, David, you get the script. What do you know going into it? Do you know anything? Uh, no, I didn't know anything going into it. So when, you, when your character died. What? My <laughs> 
were you were you shocked? Uh, yeah, I was. I was. But um, I had a conversation. The initial thing with all of us was, you know, Wes, you know, losing Wes and how much he meant to all of us. He was such an important figure in my life as an actor, but as a person as well, just as a human. Um, so yeah, but I, I love playing the role of Dewey, so I really wanted to be a part of it. I was the first one to sign on. I knew that would kind of drag the others. <laughs> you, were the, you were the worm on the hook, so to speak. Yeah. That's amazing. I, um, this was a very, this was kind of, I mean, it was Dewey, but there was, there was so many layers to this character. And in this film, I was really moved by him. And, and what was your, what was the dialogue that you guys were having with each other to sort of find that? Because it was, it was the same Dewey, like in the text message moment, you know, which is amazing, but there's also like, there's Dewey the survivor and there's Dewey who has PTSD and Dewey who's going through so much loss and pain. And that was a really, important and powerful layer to the character. And I'm just wondering what that process was like between you guys. <laughs> yeah, I admit, uh, it was challenging. <laughs> I mean, it's such a strange film because it's lasted 25 years and, and it's sort of tracked the course of uh, my life in that time period. So um, my daughter Coco was here. She saw the film for the first time, well, you know. Um, it's. That was just exciting for her to see parents on screen, you know? Um, but there were just elements about it that I had some issues with, <laughs> you know? Some of it got cut out, so it wasn't as big a deal as when I first read it. So, um, you know, he was much more of a drinker in the original script. I was like, oh, it kind of feels a little, oh. <laughs> like uh, some of the problems I had gone through in the past. So I was like, uh, that just doesn't seem like Dewey. Like, he can be depressed, but he doesn't have to be like a boozer. He can be totally like his life didn't work out. But, but um, it got a good line. <laughs> I mean, it got the good, uh, you know, that cut deep <laughs> that line. That was great. Which, uh, that was a David improv. It was amazing. Oh, was it? Yeah, that was all you. Okay, good. good. <laughs> uh, yeah, because it was real. <laughs> there were a couple moments that I was sad not to see. There's another moment when I was sitting down and and uh, Heather's character said again, oh, say hi to... And I was like, oh, and again, not, not married. <laughs> not married anymore. Kind of thing. Just you know, because... <laughs> I mean, but, yeah. did everybody kind of have like a, did everyone come with their sort of, their list of like, I need these things to be, to come back into this franchise? Um, I mean, everybody had thoughts. Yeah. All of which got incorporated. And this is, this we had a lot of talks about that with Dewey and we had a lot of talks with Nat and Courtney about it as well. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, us as the kind of new kids on the block really relied on the three of them, on you to kind of help us find our footing in the screen world and you know it was just invaluable and it, a lot of it got worked into the script i'd say most of it yeah that's great um so the movie it's funny like on the surface the movie sort of examines the sort of current trend of requels which is really smart and extremely clever but ultimately it ends up being a movie about toxic fandom um and, and it's funny because I was laughing when I saw the film because there's all these jokes about elevated horror um, and obviously, you know, the Babadook and Hereditary. And it's interesting because this movie's constantly having a conversation with itself. Um, and that's what I think makes this elevated horror. No, I'm kidding. Um, I don't believe in that. But it is, it's so interesting that that's constantly happening. But I'm curious about how your own experience sort of may have informed the film in terms of toxic fandom, you know, because I would imagine that all three of you have experienced some version of that. I know I have. Can we talk about that a little bit? Me? Or sure, me? yeah, you can start. Um, I don't know, in my experience with the horror fans is that they're the sweetest people in the world. They usually Woo! are. When you meet them, like, Three. Yeah. Just out. So 
I don't know, life's complicated. People are complicated. We all have our stuff, so I don't know. I just, I don't <laughs> I don't want to talk bad about anything. <laughs> yeah, and we hope the movie never comes off as mean spirited because that was never the goal, you know. And it was that was something that Guy and Jamie did so well in the script is starting that conversation. And I think part of what got really interesting for us is that we are literally fans making the new scream. So there was this really intense kind of meta thing happening throughout the process where we kind of felt like we were you know, without killing people, we were in that position of like, well, here's our version of it, and we're doing our thing, and you know, it's, so it was, I mean, as Scream has always been, it was a very meta experience, and that toxic fandom conversation was something that was just fun to kind of have and let the movie have, and you know, we always approach it as we're a part of that conversation because we are movie fans above all. So, you know, we're a part of it, and that's like the fun of why I think it's so fun to talk about it. Kevin. Yes, Chris. <laughs> Toxic fandom doesn't doesn't matter. You know, I haven't had any. I mean, I've had you know the occasional stalker, but, <laughs> but I, in terms of fans, no, it's been nothing but a blessed experience. They're so lovely, you know. So it's always it's nice to to do something that has lived on this long, and people still seem to dig it, and still, you know, they come up to you, oh, it's my favorite scary movie, and then now it's just, hey, it's my mom's favorite scary movie. <laughs> <laughs> so, to that end, when you, way back when, when you, when you wrote the first film, did you ever imagine that it would get this far? That there would be this many films and that this kind of an audience? Could you even imagine that? Never, never in my wildest dreams. You know, I wrote this script out of desperation. I was broke, I was hungry, I had bills to pay. It was really that struggling uh, writer. And I had uh, no money at all, and I was out of oodles and noodles, and I really wrote it out of desperation. And it poured out of me in like three days, to be honest. And I did an outline, but the outline was two weeks, and then I wrote, I mean, I was, I was moving. And um, the script I wrote over those three days is, you know, give or take, I would say 90% of what we shot. Wow, that's amazing. Um, I'm just sort of wondering about, um, again, speaking to how the longevity of the franchise, why do you think people have come back over and over again? What, what do you think is sort of the magic of this particular franchise? It, it's so interesting because I can never understand what the zeitgeist is. I never really understand what's gonna work until it works, and then you hit the zeitgeist. And, and when this movie first came out, I think the timing of it was absolutely perfect because horror movies were in the toilet, no one was making this type of film, and I was frustrated by it because I love slasher films, mm -hmm. I always have. And I wanted to write the movie I wanted to see. And so I did, and I and I really utilized the you know my knowledge of horror films just like anybody would. And I wanted to put a real teenager who had actually seen all the horror movies in a real horror horrific experience. Yeah, and it worked. It's interesting because you know there's been a, there's I've read a, a criticism that like this the, your the first scream because it was so meta and because it examined the genre so acutely and specifically that it was sort of like the death of the traditional slasher film. But when I saw the movie, I remember thinking, A, it's a love letter to the genre, and that it actually was able to give it, it was a rebirth to me. And is that sort of the sentiment, I imagine it's the sentiment of most fans, but is that something that you well, kind of felt from people? That is exactly what I felt, and, and watching this film, I feel it again. And, you know, because I really do love this movie, and I think they did a great job. And I, and I, my goal, my hope is that this is a rebirth, because it's been a long time since we did Scream 4. So this new one I'm hoping is, is it will just start, start the, you know, lead the path down so that there's more. In my, you know, I hope there is. And I, I that that love so much. <laughs> Knock on wood, but my, it would be my hope to see Scream last forever and ever and ever. Me too. Um, one other thing that I think was a real standout in the movie um, was that you, 
guys ended up with four final girls. Like, that was super, I was super fucking cool, and it was something that I really, re I remember when I saw the film for the first time, I was so focused on it. Um, was that always the design? Was that always the plan, or was someone else maybe supposed to die, or? That was in the script that we read. It was, it was exactly that, and there was something I remember reading it for the first time, and we all kind of had that same reaction that you had. We were like, that's fucking cool. I, I, the first time I read the script, I loved it because I instantly felt the sisterhood between Sam and Tara and Sydney and Gail, and that parallel. That yes. worked. I thought it worked beautifully. It was on the page, and it became and it made it to the screen beautifully. Yeah, I'm still pissed about Dewey, but <laughs> I am too. Can he? Maybe maybe he lived. We did not know. Brothers well, don't know about. Stab eight went off the rails. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, Briefly before, I mean, I've got some, some fan questions, but one other thing I just wanted to bring up. So, Easter eggs. Were they in there? Were there a bunch of them? Were there tons of them? Like, are they everywhere? There are tons. There yeah. are so many. Yeah. And it, are there any favorites you want to mention, or are we trying to keep that keep that secret? Man. Kirby. I know, Kirby was definitely a big one. You know, that whole, that YouTube page where Kirby is, um, there, that is like Easter egg central. Every single thing on there is designed to have fun if you're looking for it. And the Kirby one was a really big one. You know, we love Kirby too, and we were like, here's our chance to let her live. So Kirby lives. Kirby lives. That's me. Sorry, Kevin. <laughs> oh, one more. Let's do it. I, um, I mean, if you remember correctly, in Scream 1, Dewey died. <laughs> and, we, and Wes had the smarts to shoot it one other way. And so he lived. Smart. So, am I wrong, David? Isn't that? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yep. Very smart. We're glad that you did that. <laughs> that would be no bummer. Well, through the whole process, we, really, we fell in love with Dewey and we fell in love with David, and then suddenly it just became the right thing to do. All right, I got some, I got some fan questions. Some fan questions, okay? Um, all right, so uh, at M, Patricia M asks, was it hard to adapt the classic scream formula and f to feel and the, this sorry the classic scream formula and feel to a newer generation and audience since it's been so long since the last installment came out? Um, yes and no, because I think you know so much of that was just baked into the script that we read, and the script that Guy and Jamie wrote had that interwoven so well, where you know it had all of the stuff that we love about. The original four and then it had all these new characters that we were falling in love with and the way that their stories and the whole movie that you guys just watched did it we just felt this is this is exactly what it should be so it was kind of there and all we had to do was not mess it up uh zach alexander asks is there anything that you learned when you were making ready or not that you brought to scream you know what one that we just kind of were just talking about and i think it really we just kind of landed on this, but because Ready or Not was such a low budget movie, and we, we had to make it feel big and huge, we really, really, really relied on our actors to carry us through it and make sure that it was always focused so solely on character. So especially Samara Weaving in that, who plays the main character. We really like, we just made sure that it was always about character, character first, character first. And I think that it was a wonderful learning experience, and then I think we really tried to bring that to this, where it's more about the characters than anything, because it's one of the things, I think, one of a million reasons we love the original Scream is because you love all those characters so much. And, you know, 25 years later, we're still so attached to them. Like, and I think that's something we wanted to bring to it. Um, all right, so this is for you, David. Uh, at Beautiful Day to You Too, she's clearly a very nice person, or a serial killer. Um, what scene of all five films was the most difficult to film and why? Um, I'd say probably, uh, uh, there's a big speech, a really long speech in Scream 2, a big walking and talking speech, and I was just, didn't nail it the first time. <laughs> it was just like, oh, that's unusable. Uh, <laughs> and we tried it, it, we kept trying it that day, but it didn't work, but then I had some more time with the lines. It was just a lot of dialogue. So, 
inexperienced uh, that line. Like, it, you know, my dim-witted in inexperience. <laughs> weirdly, uh, I'm just really, yeah, somebody else don't ever have me sign that on a poster. <laughs> 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 what is it? Dim-witted inexperience. No, yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, we've got another one for you. Um, at not Daniel Penyas asks, uh, what made you say yes to coming back for this new scream? I mean, their letter really, or the conversation I had was really great. Um, but um, I just love playing the role of Dewey. I love the connection that I have with horror fans when I meet them. Uh, when you meet somebody and they're like, at this, at, this movie had such an impact on me. Some people have tattoos, <laughs> like the whole thing. So I don't know. It's just uh, you. You're in this business to make to entertain you guys. It's such an honor to be able to do it. And when you do something that you like, uh, it's 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 when all the stuff comes together, and you're like, oh, I'm so glad you like it and enjoy it, and it takes you away from just. You know, every day for a second, you can live in this world and and uh, get to know these characters. And you know, I can't say how much this movie series has meant to me. Just in Wes, especially, just how much I learned from him, how much he meant to me. Yeah. I think it's it's something that really shines in the film. You know, again, as a, as a huge fan myself, um, you know, and, you know, making movies is really hard. I mean, it's, it's just crazy, crazy hours and no sleep and a lot of struggles and, but like, there's so much love on that screen, you know? There's so much passion and there's so much affection for the characters and the franchise. And again, I'm, you know, the end of the film for Wes. I mean, I think that's a really, it's a beautiful thing, and it was a really, the whole movie feels like a tribute, you know, and I think that's really wonderful. It's super cool. Um, all right, let's see, we got one more question. I think I have time for one more. Uh, okay, this is for everybody. This is kind of a weird loaded question, but I'll ask it. Um, who has been your favorite ghost face killer and why? <laughs> Start with you. Skeet and Matthew were just, just the right <laughs> Those two are just such incredible actors, such incredible guys in general. I mean, I don't mean to like, you know, take away from, you know, everyone in this film, but they did a great job too. But just, I don't know, the Skeet and Matthew, just getting to know them and just having known them for all these years, they're just so wonderful. Man. Uh, same thing. I mean, I, I just think that it, they're so incredible in that first movie, and I think especially the whole the whole arc they have, but that kitchen scene is, I think, my favorite scene, you know, one of my favorite scenes of all time in any movie, so, yeah, just incredible. I, 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 I'm gonna jump from that, only because they are great, and they are wonderful, so whoever came afterward had a really high bar, and so I'm gonna go with Laurie Metcalf. Uh, and the reason I say that is, is, is you know, uh, Skeet and Matt, they, first of all, they're the best actors to work with. The, the ad-libs that Matt did made me look so good. And, and I, I constantly thank him for that. And I just I saw it as a shout out. He's just, it was so wonderful and, and helping me look good. But Lori Metcalf, it was a chant. She was, it was such a, a bar for her to have to do. She had this big monologue at the end. We were in the middle of rewrites. I was sitting in the theater chair writing it on sides. She was sitting there next to me and we were just trying to figure it out. And I, I wrote it three different ways and she did it three different ways and then she did it 10 different ways. She was, she just impressed me in the moment. And, I, and her commitment and her ability and her talent and her skill. I'm gonna go with Lori Metcalf only because you guys said. <laughs> if you if you ever see Matt Lillard at a horror convention, you'll see the longest line of everyone, and he's taking like like ten minutes with each person, and he's sitting, he's hugging them, he's just like it's like the, He's a great guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we're out of time, guys. Um, please give it up for.
so much. You didn't do anything without the fans. So thank you. Thank you.